I'm going to take you back to an incident uh, you mentioned in your book. I love that you accidentally overflew London by uh, accident, but um, unlike the famous hunter pilot uh, Alan Pollock, uh, you decided not to beat up the Houses of Parliament and fly under Tower Bridge, but you said hello to your old school instead. What was that like? Well, well this c comes into the category of you should never do anything in flying if you haven't planned it properly. <laughs> I had been authorised to go on a general handling detail. And I thought, hmm, mum and dad have this school in Hartenden, just north of London. It's somewhere south of Worksop. I think I'll go down and beat them up instead of doing my general handling. So I just set off southwards. And eventually I was thinking, I think I ought to have seen Hartenden by now. And by now I was flying at about six, seven thousand feet, eight thousand feet, something like that, below cloud. And I suddenly became aware of the fact that I was now flying over the biggest conurbation that I had ever seen. And the next thing I saw was a river running across my path. And I looked to the left and there was the Tower of London. And I looked to the right and there were the Houses of Parliament. And I thought, oh, expletive. Ducked up into the cloud so that nobody could see me. Turned rapidly northwards and fled back up to Worksop. Never did find Harpenden. Never did beat up my parents. <laughs> and I landed at Worksop with an absolute teaspoonful of fuel left. I was a very lucky chap. I spent months afterwards in mortal fear that I'd be caught out. You never did come clean then? I never came clean about <laughs> it at all. And as you may or may not know, I do a lot of lecturing on cruise ships. And about three years ago, I was on this cruise ship and I do I, I tell this story as in one of my lectures and this chap came up to me after the lecture he said hmm he said very interesting that story you told about flying over London he said I, I was an air traffic controller at London in 1957 and I remember seeing an airplane coming down from the north into the Heathrow control zone and then fleeing back up north again so he had spotted me, but they never identified me. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> well, you must have been very sharp-eyed. Uh, by now, you've uh, you've met Sue, your your lovely wife. Um, Thorny Island to Kinloss, at the other end of the country, where you were going to find Fly Shackleton, seems an awful long way away. But it was classic of the Air Force uh, to try and keep you apart, wasn't it? Yes, we, we, we weren't married at this point, um, Nick. Um, we, we got married when I was actually in Singapore. Mm. And the way I got married, since we're on that subject, was I went out, as I think I probably said, with the, no, I'm not sure I did, but I actually went out with the very first Shackleton to go to 205 Squadron. And what was happening was that over a period of about six or nine months, the Shackleton squadron at Changi was building up and the Sunderland squadron up at Salita on the north end of Singapore was running down. So I did three ferry trips from Aldergrove out to Changi. And it was on one of these things that I came back early to do this ferry trip, got married, had my two weeks honeymoon and then went out to Aldergrove to ferry and yet another Shackleton out to Singapore. And then Sue subsequently came out to join me there. At the time I was at Thorny Island, I was engaged to Sue. And she was still nursing at St. Thomas's Hospital then. All right. Uh, actually, I'm, I wasn't engaged to her when I was at Thorny Island. No, 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 I wasn't. She was my girlfriend, whom I'd met at dancing classes when I was 15. <laughs> That's a very sensible thing to do if you're looking for a girlfriend, I suspect. 
What game to dance in class? Yes. Hmm, yes. <laughs> Not that I can dance. <laughs> And sure. when I was, uh, I did the, uh, the multi-engine conversion at, um, on Tavastis at Thorny Island and then went up to Kinloss to do the OCU and Sue came up to see me at some point during that OCU time and I proposed to Sue at this very romantic setting. Mm, it is, it's With lovely. the castle there. And the monster. And, and of course, this is long before... English Heritage or National Trust or Scottish Heritage or whatever it is that runs it now with all sorts of barriers and mm. railings and things. I mean, it was just the castle as it was, you know, sitting there. And I'm sitting there on a sort of escarpment looking down on the castle and the pair of us were there and I proposed to her in that wonderful setting. Well done. And, uh, and she accepted me. <laughs> that I find remarkable. <laughs> so do I. <laughs> marvelous. Now I'm I'm lingering in your Shackleton time because it was a, a marvelous airplane. How serviceable were the Shackleton engines? I only ask this because whenever I met a Shackleton pilot, he would always glumly say, "Piston broke." Well, that's very interesting. You see, I've got perhaps I've got a very selective brain that just rubs out all these inconvenient things. I don't remember any problems. To me, the Rolls-Royce Griffin engine was a very serviceable engine. Well, I'm very glad to hear it. Um, glad to... And I've got no memories of endless shutdowns or problems with it at all. Excellent, excellent. Now, I uh, see you finished your QFI course at Little Rissy uh, as a B1 instructor. That's pretty rare. Did you enjoy instructing? I don't know how I did that. It was extremely rare. Mm. Yeah, it doesn't happen very often at all. Uh, don't ask me how I managed to do that, because well, I have no idea. You must have been an exceptional student instructor. Well, maybe. I don't know. My, my, my students who came along subsequently would be the people to judge that, not me. Now, you had quite a list of interesting students at Syreston. Um, who was your most memorable? Well, I suppose, in a way, it would be Angus, the Marquis of Clydesdale, who subsequently went on to become the Duke of Hamilton. Ah, excellent. And he was a phenomenal character. I mean, he was a, a true British aristocrat, plus, plus, plus. Have you stayed friends? Well... Sadly, no is the answer to that. You know, he went on to do whatever he did in the Air Force. He then went off to look after, he became the Duke of Hamilton when his father died. And very sadly, ended up getting Alzheimer's, I think. Oh, and, dear. And really um, didn't know what was going on anymore. And I, I, I always wish now that I had kept in touch with him, and I didn't. Mm one of my regrets because he was a very colourful character who who brightened the world enormously. Excellent, excellent. Um, but uh, you know, and another one was Jerry Lee who went on to become a chief test pilot at Wharton mm. and was very much involved with with the tornado and I think also with the Eurofighter. So he was a very capable, capable pilot. And I've already mentioned the one I was talking about that I always feel that I shouldn't have perhaps got him through, but there we are. Uh, so, no, I've had some wonderful students, and there's some that I do keep in touch with um, who ended up in BOAC. So uh, I do meet some of my old students from time to time. Excellent, excellent. Before we leave your time in the Air Force, any particular memories uh, that come to mind that we've missed out? Now, all I'd say about that eight years in the Air Force is that I am profoundly grateful to the Air Force for giving me the most fantastic training, for giving me the opportunity to fly all these different aeroplanes. Um, It was a, a grounding 
second to none. Second to none. And I, I personally think all pilots should start <laughs> their flying as military pilots because the military training, certainly when I was involved in it, and is, is just superb. And one of the things I've got a very strong feeling about is sort of recovery from unusual attitudes, which, you know, the, the Air Force really concentrated on that as, as an element in your flying training, as I'm sure you will agree. I hope you will. Oh, absolutely, yes. Uh, and then making, having to make a uh, instrument recovery on just the turn and slip. On the turn and slip. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly Those so. Those sort of days. <laughs> no, exactly so. And I, I think that's an element of training in the civil world that has been lacking. I think there is now a realisation, as I understand it, that it is now recognised as being an important element of training. A bit late in the day, I uh, and I agree. And the trouble is that it would all be done on simulators, and nobody really has a simulator that can accurately reproduce the sort of things that you might end up with during a jet upset. No. But we're, we're straying from the subject. Now, I, I read that, like mine, your departure from the RAF, excuse me, coincided with a downturn in the civil world and that employment was hard to find. Uh, you had a wife and two children and yep. a big rotation ridge back. That must have been a <coughs> bit of a concern for you. <coughs> yes, it was. I think I, before we actually talk about leaving the Air Force, I, I think I, I should mention that my departure from the Air Force was somewhat delayed. In February 1960, Sue and I had gone skiing in Zermatt. And I'd come back from this skiing holiday. This was with the RAF Ski and Winter Sports Association. And I went back to Sarsen, having visited my parents at their school, Sue's parents, he was a rector at Wheatamstead, a town near St Albans, and they had a nursery school incorporated into the rectory. I'd gone up to Sarston, I was back instructing, and I suddenly started feeling unwell. And then I'd feel all right. And gradually the periods I was feeling unwell got greater and greater, and I had to say to my boss, I'm sorry, boss, I'm, you know, I'm just not up to it. I'm, there's something wrong. The senior medical officer came to see me. I'm not going to mention his name. And he thought I'd got, oh, I can't remember, he thought I'd got pneumonia, he thought I'd got this, he thought I'd got that. And then one day he was off duty and a young doctor who'd just come back from Aden came in to have a look at me and I'll never forget this at this stage I was now having huge fevers and shaking and sweating and he just came in and he looked at me and he said where have you been and I said I've come back from Zermatt why he said you haven't been anywhere else I said no he said well I can tell you what you've got you've got typhoid Uh, he said, obviously, the tests will have to confirm that, but he said, I've seen typhoid before, and the fact of the matter is typhoid is not something that presents itself as a problem in this country, and the senior medical officer had never seen anybody with typhoid, and he just didn't identify it. Sue and I, Sue was diagnosed with typhoid as well, and of course, the proverbial hit the fan then, because we'd been to visit these schools, they had to shut the schools down, fumigate the schools, the Ministry of Health came all over the place. We were in hospital for eight weeks. Um, and at the end of this eight weeks, and part of the problem with typhoid is that the, the risk is that you could end up as a typhoid carrier. And that's basically why we're in for eight weeks. And then uh, I had to sort of send specimens off to path labs for about three years afterwards mm. just to absolutely belt and braces 
to ensure that neither of us uh, had ended up as typhoid carriers because that has serious implications if you end up as a carrier. But the Air Force decided that since I was leaving the Air Force, they didn't want to discharge me um, unless I was deemed to be fully fit. So they sent me to Headley Court, RAF Headley Court. Oh, lovely place. Where I had the most wonderful time. Poor old Sue had to go back to looking after the kids. <laughs> and I swanned around in Headley Court for a month. Oh, that's great. It's actually not far from uh, where I was brought up and uh, visited a few Air Force friends who were ejected and ended up there. Well, that's what the place was full of, people mm. with the, those sort of injuries. I felt a complete fraud <laughs> there, I tell you. And it was just a wonderful place to be. So um, my departure, as I say, from the Air Force was delayed as a result of all this. And as you've said, there was absolutely nothing going on in the airline world at that time. And I was literally writing to every flying school I could think of. I, oh, by the way, I'd done my commercial pilot's license exam papers on a, as a correspondence course mm -hmm. while I was in the hospital with this typhoid. Well, that was handy. Which was handy. I had eight weeks where I had nothing else to do. Um, and nothing, nothing, nothing. All sort of negative, negative, negative. And I just happened to walk in to McAlpine Aviation at Luton Airport, knocking on the door, and anything doing. And it was on a day when they'd just established that one of their pilots was going to have to lose his, well, had lost his license for a medical condition. Oh dear. And he actually stayed on. Um, as a sort of operations manager in McAlpine's and became a great personal friend of mine, a chap called Topsy Turner, who flew Lysanders during the war into oh, wow. France. Oh, dangerous job. Dangerous job, absolutely indeed. He had some stories to tell. So poor old Topsy had lost his license and I got the job. And that was a very interesting three years I spent at McAlpine's. It involved uh, a range of flying from Air, 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 airways flying in the Piaggio 166 or the Cessna 310, going to Europe all around the UK, to flying at the other end of the spectrum, an aeroplane called the Helio Courier, short takeoff and landing aeroplane, a very versatile aircraft for that sort of work. And that involved basically landing on little farm strips, paddocks, at Newmarket, that sort of thing, and taking jockeys and owners and trainers to race meetings. Mm. And it was fascinating. I mean, I got to know the English countryside quite intimately because a lot of this flying had to be done using a one inch to the mile ordnance survey map. You'd get sort of approximately to the destination and then you were sort of following it along on the ordnance survey map, going along this road here to the telephone box, turning right, and, and there's your field that you're landing in. Excellent. Very interesting flying. Yeah, you were pretty much a one-man band, weren't you? Yep, there was one other pilot um, for a while, and then we got a third one. I I became chief pilot of this of this great <laughs> enterprise. No, it was it was fantastic flying, and Kenneth McAlpine, who was the sort of uh, my ultimate boss, was a s wonderful man. Really super chap. What are we going to do about that phone? Let it ring or...